What's up guys, it's Nick Uthi with Bean Trailer. You know we love listening to your feedback online. You know we love building high quality products. As a culmination of these elements, I'd love to take you behind the scenes and show you the making of Beanstalk 2.0 and show you why we're so proud to add this trailer to our model lineup. What's up guys? Hey, how's hey, it going? Hey Nick. <laughs> so as part of the first segment of our video, the making of Beanstalk 2.0, I wanted to start with the sales team and ask you about a recent launch. What are some of the reactions you've heard from the bean community regarding Beanstalk 2.0? Um, I could take this one. So when we first launched it, we soft launched it at the Overland Expo um, back in October. So some of you might not know that. Um, and I think the reaction was super, a lot of excitement, um, especially from the Overland community where this was, you know, the lifted version, you know, you could get off road with it and, and be able to get something that's light and more affordable. So we had an initial, you know, um, a lot of people with interest in purchasing the trailer back then. Then with our hard launch in February, um, it feels like we got a whole new segment of the population and the one that we've been trying to reach, um, you know, with something that, you know, customers that were, had 1,500 pounds of tow capacity that have cross treks and RAV4s and, you know, Outbacks, they were reaching out to us excited that finally there was a bean that they could really feel comfortable pulling and that they could, you know, whether or not they can afford a more expensive trailer, some people just don't want to pay $30,000 for a trailer. So this um, was, we were able to really talk to and offer a trailer to folks that we've been turning away for years. Yeah, I'd say over, overwhelmingly positive to start the launch with this. The biggest hesitation I've seen from people is the people that are familiar with how awesome the galley is in our other trailers with the back hatch and the built-in stove and, and water and everything like that. But most people that have come in and actually seen it in person and realized how usable that side galley is and how much of a weight and price mm -hmm. savings it is, they, they find that it's a, a good trade-off for them. So it's, it's, it allows you to get into a teardrop trailer at a much lower price point and still have a really usable galley. Yeah, and, and I've used both galleys and really love the galleys on our standard trailers. But I found this one really usable as well. I enjoyed cooking um, with the 2.0 when we've camped in it. You both touched on this a little bit, but how do you think this trailer will expand the reach of the Bean brand and attract new customers? I, I think it's huge. It's a, it's a completely different market than we've ever been in, um, just with, with both the price point and the weight. Cindy talked about getting into cross tracks, rav fours, stuff like that, that are lightest weight trailer previously was 1650 and that's with no additions on it and having this one starting just under 1200 pounds it's it's huge a lot of smaller vehicles are going to be able to tow that and you know it's not just big trucks that want to be able to to go off-road and camp and and have fun with the trailer yeah we have folks calling and messaging us almost daily since you know bean has existed on what trailers do you have for um, a car that has a lower tow capacity and we've had to turn those folks away. So it's been really nice to be able to really have something to offer people. So um, yeah, that's, like Drew said, that's a whole new segment of the population that, um, that we're reaching. That and the price point as well. We've, you know, we've always used high quality materials and everything, which is where a lot of that weight came from. Mm -hmm. But now with removing that galley and rear hatch and just kind of redesigning the trailer for, you know, to start at 16 grand, right now and then we've been averaging right around 20 for this trailer it's there's nothing really out there with the the build type and mm -hmm. quality that 2.0 has that you can get in that price range right. what's the first question where are we going? Where are we going from? Caleb, what was it like having to produce Beanstalk 2.0 in such a short time frame? The biggest difficulty with Beanstalk in a short time frame is our other existing manufacturing. Um, sending parts to our metal shop, to our fiberglass shop, 
to our router. Um, it takes time to make those parts. And if we're inserting jobs for prototype parts, it's delaying our other manufacturing and has an impact on the amount of throughput we can do in a day. So we have to carefully select when we send jobs and how big the jobs are that we're sending for new product development and inserting into existing manufacturing. Yeah, there's like a pretty fine balance on, right, like keeping current customers' projects going, right, and getting things completed on time and not having development interrupt that process. And so shorter development time periods, it's a really fine balance of trying to mash those two things together. Like you said, we have a small engineering team. How do you two manage the relationship between product development and existing manufacturing? And what does that process look like? I would say it, I would say it almost like goes in sections, right? So typically starts with just me working on new who, parts and crap like that. Who knows what he's working on? Right, yeah, like <laughs> I work on whatever I want, right? I get some stuff built, and then when it comes time, Caleb gets involved, right? And depending on the time frame, Caleb gets, it just depends on when he gets involved in the process, right? Then he's coming in, we're working together, right, on, on everything that really includes both of us. And then there's kind of this transition phase where I phase out, and Caleb takes a hold of that project and is taking it to the line. Yeah, Br Brigham takes care of a lot of the initial prototyping, um, getting things drawn up to put it in Mark's head so he can see what does this look like. Um, and we're, Brigham does a good job at taking whatever is in Mark's head, pulling it out, putting it on you know our, our development room floor here so that Mark can see if we're, if we're bringing what he's picturing to life. So I've heard you say before that your job is pretty easy and everything usually runs perfectly smooth, right? Yeah, everything doesn't run perfectly smooth. Getting everybody to coordinate parts, paint, even processes, getting the tools we need to complete processes is complicated. There's a lot of, a lot of people involved that we all have to bring together and be on the same page, on the same timeline. And that's where you know, our, our development's process and ticket system really helped us with this so that we could assign different projects to different people, feed it all back through um, to get Mark's approval on the, the parts and then send those back out to get prototypes made and get it assembled. Um, and that, that development ticket process is what really allowed us to do this so quickly. Um, and then another thing that allowed us to go so quick was borrowing parts. Um, our, sh our shelf or being stocked, the sidewalls um, are actually off of our other trailers. We directly took the pieces from that mold, bolted them together, and made a new center section to fit that rear window. And being, being able to borrow those parts was great to get a shell made for stock 2.0, but the impact that that had on other production is they didn't have sidewalls to run other shells. So we had to coordinate finishing existing production and getting ahead to a point that we could borrow that tooling, make the new shell, and then give it back to them. So there's just a lot of communication between different teams and different entities here at Bean that allowed us to rapidly develop this trailer and still have that high quality product at the end of it. Can you speak to the unprecedented levels of testing Beanstalk 2.0 has went through? Yeah, Beanstalk's testing, the, the biggest portion of that was in Moab and the trailer survived. I think the the crazy part to me is that the trailer survived Poison Spider. I, I wouldn't drive my truck on that trail, and I sure wouldn't pull a trailer on that trail. And we did it, and we, we came home with a little bit of rock rash and some, some parts, suspension parts that we, had, we damaged, and we knew about it. Um, but overall, the, the trailer is solid. The frame is solid. There's no cracking. There's no signs of stress on the frame. Um, and and that, that type of testing is just, just shows that when we're, when we're building this product, we're building a solid, high-quality product that can take abuse, and we don't expect our customers to be able to break this trailer mm -hmm. on their own. And it's going to take some pretty severe 
trails and events to, to do anything significant to bean. It really, it really gives us things you can't get in a warehouse. You can't get bouncing, you can't get impact, you can't get that dynamic loading and unloading. You, you're not gonna get that oscillation and vibration in a, in a warehouse. So something that can add big impacts and big events in a short period of time really just helps us with that, that development process and pushing things forward without having to spend hundreds of hours lab studying, we can, we can put it in real world use and, and see how it holds up. Yeah, that's, that's kind of another thing that I think a lot of people, kind of to answer your question earlier, that people don't see about the development process, is we'll have trips that we go on, like the Poison Spider trip, where you guys have seen footage of the cr trailer doing crazy stuff. But like, these trailers get taken out on rough terrain, all the time, right? Just to be testing the little fine details of things and you guys never see that, right? But, but all of that combined testing is really what's showing us what's working, what's not working, what needs to be changed. Um, I know we get comments like, I would never take my trailer on something like that, right? Like, yes, of course, right? Half of it's marketing, half of it is testing, right? We're doing this because there's data that we get from it, specific data we're taking it to the extremes, right? So you guys never have to, right? Because there's a lot of companies that never test to the extreme. So they only test to a certain level and then you may get a customer that's willing to push their product to the extreme. Some people do, right? Like they just will. That's when you'll see something fail, right? So if we can take it to the points where no one else will go, right? That can just ensure that you're gonna get a product that you just know it's not gonna have those issues if you start to push it a little bit, right? On where you wanna take your trailer. And so all of that just helps you to get a better product. I would bet short of a couple customers we've had that rolled their trailers in off-road situations, most of our customers are never gonna do the things and reach that, that level that we do with our bean mm -hmm. trailer while we're testing it. Yeah. So to wrap up from a product development standpoint, what do you wish our customers knew more about that doesn't get shown online or on our social media channels? For sure. I wish our customers knew how many times we change things to perfect the product. We're not making a table and the first iteration of that table is what we sell to you. We'll go, we'll make a table. We won't like how it functions, how it fits. We'll make another one. And we're not just, we're not just doing that in CAD. We're getting physical parts made. They're going through our plant, they're getting coded, they're getting painted, and we're installing it on the trailer and if we don't like the fit, finish, or function, we're changing it. And I think that's, that's one place where mm -hmm. the, the amount of time we have to develop and the amount of times that we change something are really like invisible to our customers and they don't understand that we care, we care about that enough that we're willing to make the changes to meet our customers' needs and requirements at Bean and especially on our new product development, like Beanstalk 2.0. Right? Yeah. We both had used that thing and yep. we knew that it worked. Yeah. So Brigham, do you, uh, you remember this thing? Yeah. So spent a lot of hours. Oh yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is a fun working. project. This thing? Yeah. This is a trailer that uh, we were working on when uh, the market compressed and we realized that we needed a much more affordable uh, product in our line. Uh, luckily, uh, one of the things that we learned with uh, being squared was that this galley setup that Brigham and I tested on numerous trips, uh, we knew that that worked great and really it was that knowledge that made it possible for us to think about uh, creating Beanstalk 2.0 and being able to save the expense of the galley. Okay, so we're gonna kinda go into some of the innovative features on the new Stock 2.0. These are some of the features that just kinda make this trailer different from everything else, um, but make it work really good. So first we kinda have the kitchen package, right? So this is gonna include your table, your jerry can mount, and your storage option, right? So this is super modular and configurable, right? You can run dual sinks, dual cutting boards, or nothing, right? You can put in whatever jerry can you want. 
You can integrate features, you know, like there's a bunch of different companies who have faucet systems for it. This makes it so, you know, you can set up a kitchen super fast, water's right where you need it, you're not moving it around. Um, this just makes for a really easy kitchen setup. Another feature that's been really awesome for Bean in general, right, is going to be the new roof rack system. Um, so this is our new low profile system. This is going to decrease the cost of the roof rack just because cost is a big factor on this trailer. It's also going to give people the ability to have a roof rack and put awnings and stuff like that on it, but it, it's also decreased the height by about three inches from our standard roof rack. So there's a lot of customers that still want to be able to fit these things in their garage. Um, and sometimes the roof rack can be that deciding factor. So this trailer now has that option, which will allow you to be able to fit it in your garage easier. Um, another awesome feature with this trailer that just keeps it modular and simple, right? Because simple was a big thing on this trailer, um, is the power stations in this thing, right? So this trailer's got a really simple electrical system. You're not gonna be um, worrying about, you know, house batteries that you've got to somehow heat when you're trying to charge them. Um, it's got a goal zero system. You can either get the Yeti 500, the 1500X, or the 3000X. So this allows you to, to kind of get as much power as you need for your trailer. It also allows you to take it inside and use your power station wherever else you want. Um, we also have people who will buy beans and then they've got to store them in a storage unit. Well, they don't have a way to charge it, right? So now they can just take that out, take it home, plug it in, and they're ready to go for their next trip. Um, one other thing that's been really crucial to this build, right, is we've got other awesome companies that we've partnered with for this build. Um, you guys have seen the Kamek awnings that we have on these things. You literally just grab it, pull it out. It takes five seconds to set it up, and that simulates that galley with a hatch coming up and over it, right? It keeps it fast and simple and practical. Um, so that's a really cool product that makes this trailer a little bit more functional. Um, another one is Iceco, right? They're coming out with all-weather fridges. So we've eliminated the galley on this thing, which most fridges need to be inside. They can't get wet, right? And so we can still give you a fridge option while we don't have to give you a galley or a really expensive front box, right? And this, this keeps the trailer module, right? Like you can do what you want with this. You can put whatever you want on the front. Um, but we have worked with some companies like that. Um, one other thing that we also really wanted to focus on to make this trailer function really well is it doesn't have a propane system, right? So our old propane mounts are a little bit of a pain to get on and off. Um, they're not too bad, but we've had people ask for a faster way to do it, right? So the new mounts literally just have two rubber latches, compression latches. You'll pop those off and your tank comes out. So that makes it super fast to take that back to your kitchen hook up your Descada or whatever you're using, and you're ready to camp. <laughs> I think it is too, yeah. You got this twinkle in your eyes. Oh, yeah. Just hitting the camera to the right. Live doing what? <laughs> <laughs> What's the question? Let's start with you, Brigham. What were the key design principles applied to the Beanstalk 2.0? Yeah, perfect. Um, so with this trailer, um, we took a lot of feedback that we had gotten from customers for a long time, and with the change in the market, we just knew we, we needed to adapt, right, and, and build a trailer that can open up the doors to some new customers, right? So first and foremost with Bean, like we're never gonna sacrifice on our quality. So this trailer is built to the same quality standards as all of our other trailers, it's still the one piece shell, right? The construction is pretty much the same on this thing. Um, so that was super important for us to hit that. Um, but with doing that, um, another huge factor was the cost of this thing. So we, we needed to make a trailer um, at a lower price point that we could get more customers into. Um, and doing that, right, we've talked about eliminating that rear galley. That saves us a lot of money. Also, learning from Squared, people love more interior space, right? So now you've got more interior space. You've got that side galley that we, you know, we found out worked good on Squared. Um, and that was able to help us get a trailer, trailer at a better price point. Um, and then third, we've got weight, right? So another really cool thing about this trailer is now people with two-door Jeep Wranglers, Subaru owners, Tesla owners, right? They've got a trailer now that's super high quality that they can pull behind their vehicle um, and feel comfortable taking it on trips. Um, 
And with doing that, that really has just opened us up to a lot more people being able to get inside of a bean. Yeah, it, it's, it's crazy the flexibility that this trailer has from a range of buyers, right? If you're a Tesla buyer and you're looking for lightweight and a lower coefficient of drag, you don't get a spare tire on the side. You don't get a roof rack. You don't even have to get a fan on the top. Mm -hmm. And you know, you're gonna have this uh, teardrop shaped trailer that is going to be reduced drag compared to our other trailers. Or let's say that you have a uh, Rubicon two-door Wrangler and our other beans were too heavy for it. This same trailer that would have been, that's great behind a Tesla can be configured with a four-inch timber and lift and uh, a roof rack and awnings and a huge front tray and rock rails. And, you know, if, if there's anything that we proved in the last few months is that this thing is a beast off road. Mm -hmm. So what happened last year? Basically, shipments in the entire industry were less than half in 2023 than they were in 2022. You know, because of COVID, you came off of this huge boom in the RV industry where there were record shipments and the industry was basically growing at uh, an exponential rate. We were basically doubling in sales every year. And, uh, and then some things happened uh, at the end of 2022 that we saw could be problematic from a sales standpoint in an item like this that's really uh, sensitive to interest rates, sensitive to um, positive feelings about the economy and plus during that time man like our our material expenses like for fiberglass and aluminum and all the components were either not available or uh super expensive to source which meant you know that our our prices were increasing pretty rapidly so we you know we saw with the increase in prices because of inflation with the increase in interest rates, we knew that, uh, that the growth that we had been experiencing wasn't gonna continue. And luckily we saw that and made provisions for it, um, you know, starting at the end of 2022. And Brian, you know, you, you probably can speak better to the, you know, provisions we did to mitigate last time we sat down and talked um, we talked a little bit about one of the things about being like an ex you know a, a, an experienced manufacturer and one of the things that set us apart was our systems our ability to see what was coming plan for it make adjustments and being a part of a company that makes more than just trailers um, we had an opportunity that are really a lot of people in the industry didn't. Um, it's really a, an incredible strength that we have um, where we have this other work that actually we had a ton of um, and we could see what was happening on the sales front and plan and we didn't, we didn't let, we didn't have any layoffs. You know, if you think about the reduction in the RV industry, yeah. there's nobody out there that didn't just, you know, shed shed people well, we don't a lot of them, anybody a lot of them closed down yeah. either permanently or for at least a few months yeah. and we talked about some of that you know last time we uh sat down just on uh you know uh, inexperienced manufacturing if you don't have the systems in place it's just hard to see and plan it just is yeah. and um so we were able to see that coming we were able to, to flex our employees to work on other things and keep all of our experienced people 
you know, the people that we had that have grown and built these trailers, they're still here, right? Like we, we still have them and they're making our trailers still today. Uh, we won manufacturer of the year in the state of Utah in 2020. And last year we had a year that compare is comparative to that year, um, which is crazy to think about with what happened in the industry. And really a lot of it was just the advantage that we have in our people and systems to plan, um, to plan for a, a situation like this where sales fluctuate, flex to other work, um, and still be you know a strong company. We're we're in a position that's as strong as we ever have been, you know, going into a new year where the industry got cut in half. Um, it's an exciting time really for us where we've developed new trailers at the same time. I mean, a lot of people in that environment they you know you have to cut development, right? Right. We were working on a, a two other trailers, right? One yeah. got finished. Um, it's just an incredible situation that we, find, you know, we we put ourselves in. Actually, three other trailers if you include Stalker. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, really, an incredible year that's setting us up for in, you know, for, for a for a great 2024. Really, um, all all stemming in a in a in an industry that got cut in half. So how exactly did these market trends impact Bean's production strategy? Yeah. So to, to, uh, to understand uh, the genesis of Bean Stock 2.0, um, you have to understand that uh, we were developing probably the most expensive trailer in the history of our company uh, right as sales started to decrease drastically. So we had to do some market research and figure out, you know, what the market was looking for. Um, and it became pretty clear pretty quickly that they were looking for something that was much more affordable. And it's always been much more expensive for us to build a bean trailer uh, than it is to build a traditional teardrop with plywood and aluminum. Ironically, we have a huge aluminum plant, so it would really be very easy for us to develop design, you know, basically another Me Too trailer that uh, was had cheap components in it and you know was at a lower price point and had lots lots of cheap components in it um, that probably would have been the easier path uh, but that's not something that I don't, I don't think we would have been proud of that you know we, and, and we definitely know that the way we use these trailers you know that's not going to survive long term for my last question of the series, have you guys faced any challenges balancing affordability with Bean's core values? Beyond affordability? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the quality standard is just one that you hear. One of the big things is trying to actually let people see Bean. Um, it's actually hard to describe and, and uh, just understand the difference in quality without seeing, touching, feeling, getting inside one. Um, and that is an experience that, you know, when we go to trade shows and things like that, someone can walk up and just be like, man, these are expensive. And then as soon as they get inside, they're like, okay, I, I understand. I, I can see, I can see why this is, uh, this is definitely a, a high quality product. And, uh, just, we had, um, in, order, in order to satisfy the demand of these customers that were looking um, at, a, at, a, at a price point that was much lower than we could build to, we had to set some really aggressive cost targets, uh, weight targets, in order to, to meet the, the demand of, of this segment in the industry that was craving um, a bean. And uh, so to, to come up with, this is how much you know, our materials can cost, this is how efficient we have to be able to build it. This is how weight it, this is how light it needs to be and give that, you know, to our development and engineering group. 
and uh, just to watch them squirm about <laughs> how aggressive those numbers uh, were compared to what we were used to manufacturing. Um, and, uh, you know, it's funny what happens when you challenge people sometimes, you know. Um, you just attack it. You know, you start dissecting the cost of your trailer and where, where you can where you can keep that quality intact. What options do we have to not lose quality, but to uh, take steps toward that aggressive goal. And, um, you know, it's one improvement at a time, one idea at a time, evolving uh, all the ideas until you get to uh, a solution. Um, and, you know, we weren't sure all the way through the path whether we were gonna get quite there, but um, we yeah. did, we did, we did get there. Yeah, usually, uh when it comes to things that have to be durable, like an off-road trailer or a race car or a rocket, or, you know, like you have to trade more dollars for less weight, right? The, mm -hmm. the path to less weight is more dollars, but we needed to spend less dollars to get to lower weight without impacting durability and off-road worthiness so yeah those were some uh challenges for our engineers